Greetings. I am delighted to welcome you or welcome you back to the fifth and final lecture of our new series, Arts at Graham. The theme this week is music. My name is Emily Lim Osborne, and I am the interim dean of the Graham School of Continuing and Professional, Continuing Professional and Liberal Studies. I am also a professor here in the Department of History here at the University of Chicago. For those of you who have been with us at previous lectures, you know what comes next in my introduction. I explain how this webinar works. I tell you about Graham, our mission, and the origins of this Arts at Graham series. I then introduce our speaker and moderator. So for those of you for whom this is all familiar territory, I invite you to post a comment in the question and answer box. Tell us, the organizers behind this series, what brought you here to Arts at Graham? How did you find out about this series? Is this series your first engagement with the Graham School or for one of many? What did you like about this series? What would you like to see more of in terms of free pro programming and other kinds of offerings? We'd love to hear from you. We'll also be sending a follow-up email that will invite you to also give us some feedback on this series. Um, so if you are not inclined to fill in the Q&A box right now to answer those questions, don't, you don't need to, but you're welcome to. If you arrived a bit early, you heard Gabrielle Forge in Paradisum. We hope that you enjoyed listening to this piece. You will hear it again as Dr. John Lawrence uses it as an example to make the case for sonority for how, in this case, the addition or subtraction of a single instrument can transform how we hear and understand a particular piece of music. The, present the presentation today is in a webinar format. That means you are not able to use your microphone, and your microphone and your camera is turned off. We are recording today's talk so that we may post it online for other people to listen to and watch at a later date. You are able to communicate with the moderators through the question and answer box. We encourage you to do so. Dr. Lawrence will pause halfway through his lecture to take questions from the audience. The moderators will convey the questions to him. We will likely not be able to answer all of your questions, but when one of the moderators does ask a question, we will read your name. At the end of the talk, there will be further question and answer, and we will also delve into the assignment, which was on the website, if you were able to get to that. But if you weren't able to prepare the assignment, don't worry. There will be room and space for everyone to be able to participate. As many of you know, the Graham School is dedicated to connecting with curious continuing learners, which we do through a, through a variety of classes and offerings. Today, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about the basic program, which is our great books program. Students are guided by our instructors who are gifted in the art of discussion as they delve into classic works of philosophy, politics, economics, and literature. The basic program is a four-year certificate program, and part of its beauty lies in the fact that people are there because they want to learn, because they want to engage and contribute to a community of learning that is dedicated to critical thinking and reading. There are no grades and there are no papers. What's more, we have cohorts of people who have completed the certificate and they continue on with our alumni sequences. We have groups of people who have been doing the basic program in some shape or form for years, even decades. So if this sort of intellectual camaraderie is something that you think sounds intriguing, if perhaps a bit daunting, I really encourage you to attend a sample discussion. Dr. Kendall Sharp will be leading a discussion of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address on Thursday, September 17th. There are two times, 9.30 and 6 p.m. Please join us. And I'll add further, people come to this program from all walks of life. Sometimes people who studied these things in their youth but didn't appreciate great books and all the insight and perspective they offer. And other times people come to the program because they never had such an opportunity before. It is Graham's commitment to humanistic inquiry that helps gave rise that helped gave rise to this series. It is no longer possible to go to museums and concert halls as we once did. Here at the University of Chicago, U Chicago Presents, which typically brings our community concerts and performances of chamber music, jazz, contemporary, and world music, and world music has had to pivot. Its website is now home to a number of archive performances. Earlier today, I was just watching a conversation with Anthony McGill, the principal clarinetist of the New York Philharmonic, with Professor Tom Holt, a historian here in the department, in my, a colleague of mine in the Department of History. 
So likewise, we take the equation, the occasion to both celebrate music and learn more about it today with Dr. John Lawrence. Dr. John Lawrence is a humanities teaching fellow at the University of Chicago, where he earned a PhD in music history and theory in just now in 2020. He has previously taught at the University of Notre Dame and at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He is a reviewer for the Chicago Classical Review, and he frequently pre presents pre-concert lectures for the U Chicago Presents concert series. His research focuses on performance analysis, theories of meaning, and musical form in the long 19th century. His work has been published in the Journal of Music Theory. This year, he will be teaching philosophy courses in the Humanities Corps, as well as courses on music criticism and analysis. Another introduction is also in order. My fellow moderator is Adriana Obioz. She is a PhD student in art history, and her research focuses on 20th century Latin American art. She is passionate about public arts programming and is supporting the Graham School this summer and fall as a graduate intern. And I will add, it's been a pleasure to get to know her and to work with her. I would like to tip my hat to two other people who are behind the scenes here. So uh, Jan and Gus, get ready please to show your faces. Uh, Jan Watson is the Associate Director of the BASIC program. She is also an astute observer and counselor and has been a wide guide to, gu guide to us all through this webinar. The other person who has helped us tremendously with this process is Gus Moss. Gus is a program manager of liberal programs here at Graham and he has really taken on the task of managing the series and its back end, as we always say, from start to finish. I am happy for Gus, but sad for us. In just a couple of weeks, Gus will be moving on to start a master's program here at the U Social Sciences here at the University of Chicago. We will miss him here at Graham. And with that, I will turn the stage over to John Lawrence. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me for my lecture this evening and of course, a great thanks to Emily and all the folks at the Graham School for inviting me to deliver this lecture. Uh, let me set up my slides. Okay, hopefully you should be able to not merely hear my voice, but also see my title slide. Let us begin. Imagine this possibly familiar situation you're driving your new car and you decide to test the radio. You begin flipping through stations, searching for one you like. You stay on each station for a couple of seconds at most, but this is long enough for you to discern what style of music you're hearing. You aren't consciously analyzing this music, but each time you change frequencies an awareness of the new station style and the wealth of cultural associations that go with it floods your senses entirely involuntarily. This is a commonplace occurrence, but one that is not easily explained by conventional approaches to music education. In fact, the higher up you go in education, sometimes the worse it gets. That is because most writing and teaching about music tends to focus on harmony, rhythm, and form, the building blocks of what we might call musical syntax. But a vast realm of musical meaning stretches beyond syntax. You reached it in that car. Those few seconds you spent on each station were too short for syntax. During each interval, you likely heard harmonic and rhythmic combinations common to myriad styles. And yet every time you were instantly transported to a very precise location in the musical landscape. What you latched onto was not syntax, but sonority. There are two main components of sonority that we're going to talk about this evening, timbre and balance. Timbre is what's left over in a sound after you take away pitch and loudness. In other words, it what, it's what allows you to distinguish a violin from a flute, even if they're playing the same exact note, or my voice from the voice of your best friend. You can probably see already how this carries a lot of cultural meaning, how the timbre of a voice helps you immediately distinguish an opera singer from a pop singer, or an electric guitar from a flamenco guitar, or 18th century organ music from gospel organ music, and so on and so forth. Our second element, balance, is the relative loudness of different sounds. You might imagine something like a sound engineer's console or mixing board, 
knobs and sliders, allowing you to manipulate each individual instrument. It might also be clear to you why a certain sound balance is a precondition for the perception of meaning. For any individual element to affect you, it has to be audible. And the relative audibility of different elements might cause you to draw conclusions about how they relate to each other or which one is more important. As I say, these two parameters are the main components of what I'm calling sonority. And sonority is the sound of music in the talk's title, not the Rogers and Hammerstein musical. Apologies to any of you that were lured here under false pretenses. Now, all of this may lead you to ask, if sonority is so important, why don't we talk about it more? And the answer is that music studies tend to exclude sonority due to a mixture of philosophical conviction and practical convenience. The philosophy declares that pitch and rhythm are the essence of music, while sonority is an adornment. Change a pitch in your performance and you've played a wrong note. But you can take a piece that was written for one instrument and play it on another, and people recognize it as being the same piece. Therefore, pitch and rhythm are what fix the piece's identity. Then there's the practical side. When scholars analyze a piece of music, they generally want to do so in the same way that one might analyze a poem or a painting with one stable object or text that everyone looks at. In classical music, that stability exists if you're talking about the score, the sheet music of a given piece. But scores don't have sounds. If I want to talk about what music actually sounds like, I have to play you some sort of performance and every performance varies from every other, creating contingency. And for orchestral music at least, timbre and balance are among the chief respects in which they'll vary. And when it comes time to talk about timbre and balance, what do we even say? We can talk about pitch and rhythm with an almost scientific rigor. F is precisely one semitone higher than E, and a half note is precisely twice as long as a quarter note. But how much softer is pianissimo than forte? and how much darker is the sound of a trombone than the sound of a clarinet. We can quantify pitch and rhythm, but for the sonority, we seemingly have only metaphors. In my talk today, I'm gonna to tackle these issues by pairing a different element of sonority with each of the two problems. First, I'm going to discuss timbre together with practicality. I'm going to show that as ephemeral as timbre can be, it can still be easy to talk about if we focus on the particular functions that it performs for a listener's attempt to make meaning out of music. Second, I'm going to discuss balance together with the philosophical issues. I'm going to show you that a lot of the basic elements of syntax depend on sonority. That is, things we take to be stable parts of pieces can actually radically change from performance to performance such that we need to reconceive what we think categories like melody or counterpoint really mean. And since that breaks nicely into two halves, we will take a pause between them uh, to allow you to ask some questions to me if you'd like. Now, all of our examples are going to be drawn from 19th century classical music since, as Emily mentioned, that happens to be the main area that I study. But I could have given this lecture using examples from many other styles and time periods. If you're curious about how this would work, please feel free to ask me in the question period. Okay, let's start with the first of our two topics then, timbre. In order to understand how you process timbre, we need to first discuss how you process music or sound in general. Any piece of music is a giant mass of sonic information, individual tones flitting about in the air. In music cognition, the technical term for this is an auditory scene. As a non-musical example of a scene, you could imagine a busy restaurant, if you remember what those are like. There is the clink of glasses in the background, there's the people at your own table talking, maybe you can hear some of the people at the other table or a waiter. In order to make sense of all this sonic information of this scene, your mind needs to separate everything into comprehensible units. So here I'm going to introduce some technical terms to define these mental tasks. One task that your brain is performing is separating the sound into lines that flow across time. This vertical separation is called stream segregation. This is like taking a braided rope of sounds and unbraiding it into a series of threads that can be followed separately. So in the restaurant analogy, 
This would mean hearing a series of words and understanding that they are being spoken by the same person. That is, if you close your eyes and if the people are sit seated in a similar uh, part of the room, the way your mind is figuring out who's saying what is you're isolating any individual voice by noticing noises that seem to have approximately the same timbre and volume, just the same task that you're doing in the musical cases we'll examine. Uh, so another task, oh, sorry, uh, and I forgot to, there's the name for it, stream segregation. <clears throat> uh, the, uh, <clears throat> The other task that you are performing is deciding where formal units begin and end. When dealing with speech, this might involve hearing which syllables make up a word, which words make up a clause, and so on and so forth. In music, this might mean what constitutes a phrase, a theme, etc. This horizontal separation that you see on the screen is called formal segmentation. So the previous one was segregation. This one is segmentation. So if we stick with the metaphor I had before of uh, the thread, after you've unbraided the rope and you have those little individual strands, you're now cutting that strand into segments. In addition to separating the music into its component parts, which were the two tasks I've just covered, you also need to develop a sense of how these parts fit together, which means applying mental categories. And we're going to call that conceptualization. Now, you may notice that I'm describing all of these things in quite perceptual psychological terms. This is rather unusual uh, when talking about musical meaning. Most people would treat these structures as already contained within a piece of music, rather than as something imposed upon music by a listener. The listener is treated as the receiver of information already encoded in the musical score. That's why ear training and music appreciation classes, if you've taken them, are taught the way that they are, to make people become more perfect receivers. Uh, this is what I, in turn, want to begin to train you out of. I want you to come to a perceptual perspective that thinks that all of these things are added by your mind to the sounds. So to see the effect that timbre can have on this process of perception, with real music rather than laboratory conditions, I'm going to use a passage from the last movement of Faure's Requiem, uh, which is the music that you were hearing if you arrived early tonight. I've chosen this particular piece because there are multiple editions of it, and in one of them, Faure added an additional instrument. So we're going to start with the 1900 edition. I'm going to play this passage for you first with only the words on the screen. As you listen, please consider segmentation, so where you hear the phrases begin and end, and stream segregation, how many simultaneous lines you're able to pull apart. Okay, uh, let's start with segmentation. I've cheated perhaps by the way I've placed the line breaks on the screen because that's exactly how my mind at least segments this passage. There are four phrases, or, um, each of them corresponding to one of the lines of text as I put it. Now to discuss stream segregation, uh, we may wish to look at the score which I've now put on the screen. Now for those of you who are not used to reading scores off the screen, don't worry. This is a visual aid for those of you that are comfortable with reading music, but it isn't strictly necessary for those of you that aren't. It's just there uh, as a visual aid. So, uh, of course, the sopranos who are singing have their own stream for most of the passage since they're singing the main text and the melody throughout. And I feel the rest of the choir has its own stream when it's added at the very end. But what about the accompaniment? If you told me to, and I really concentrate, I could stream the upper part of the organ and harp, the, the lines going da da di di da dum. I could stream that separately from the rest of the accompaniment instruments. But if I'm honest, most of the time, 
I collapse them into one mass of background lines, not really plucking anything out of this to follow. So I'm following the soprano, I'm hearing the orchestra as one mass of background, and then I'm paying attention to the choir when they enter. Uh, as I stated before, this was the passage in the 1900 version. We're now going to listen to this music again in the 1893 version. There are lots of little changes to the string parts. You don't need to pay attention to any of those, but most striking of all is the addition of a new timbre, which does not appear anywhere else in the movement. This is provided by two French horns. Uh, so let's listen to what they add in Philippe Herbega's recording of this passage. What a world of difference those horn parts make. So let's start with stream segregation. Uh, I hope you will agree that you are aware of the horns as carrying their own line. As a consequence, you paid more attention to the notes that they were playing. But those notes aren't new. They are already part of the string parts in both versions. So you heard those notes before. But when I at least hear this passage without horns, those notes are just part of a cloud of string harmony. It's only when the horns are doubling these notes or playing them as well that they become a separate thread that I can follow. Okay, so that's segregation. How about formal segmentation then? Uh, looking now at the sheet music, the way I segmented the 1900 version is as I have it here. Two bars plus two bars plus two bars plus three bars. So if you look at it, that lines up with where the line breaks in the text were before. Um, now, the addition of the horns doesn't cause me to override that segmentation. I agree with it still. But additionally, I hear the first three bars of the horns part as sort of a gesture embedded within that, overlapping between the second and third segments. In other words, I don't break up the melody differently, but I allow for the possibility that there is another segment, another structure nested within it. So I've been dealing with the most mechanical parts of this thus far, breaking the music into components. So what about the last of the three that I mentioned? What about conceptualization? Well, I would say that the horns grant me access to a series of metaphors that I wouldn't get from the pitches and rhythms of this music alone. In this case, I can't help feeling sunlight and warmth, like a sunrise or beam of light. But these metaphors don't seem confined to the horns part. For me, it's as if they illuminate the entire passage, suffusing it with their warmth. The addition of this one timbre allows me to reconceptualize everything else that's going on in those few bars. The sunrise in the foray is conceptualization on a metaphorical level. But we can also discuss how timbre affects our conceptualization of the most fundamental musical categories. Take highness and lowness, a distinction we teach on day one of music theory. Musicians generally understand this in terms of high and low pitch, but this is not necessarily how non-musicians process this. By the way, the clip I'm about to play is the loudest. You might want to adjust your volume down just for this one and bring it back up later. So what I'm going to ask you to consider now is what happens to your voice when you're on helium? Uh, you could adjust your volume back up now. <laughs> so if you ask most people what's going on here, they'll say, oh, his voice got higher. That's what helium does to your voice. But actually, he finished singing the passage in the same key and at the same pitch level, 
what got higher is not pitch, but timbre. So for non-musicians, highness or lowness as a concept is often a matter of both pitch and timbre. And cognition studies bear this out. If you play non-musicians two different pitches with the same timbre, so for example, on the same instrument, they correctly assess which note is higher. But if you play two different pitches with two different timbres, such as on two different instruments, their accuracy goes way down. They start getting confused about which note is higher in pitch because timbre starts interfering with the way they perceive this. Um, I'm going to give you one more example of conceptualization with fundamental concepts. The first half is drawing to a close though. So if, you've, if you have questions, get those at the ready. So besides highness and lowness, uh, consonance and dissonance are another example of phenomena in which timbre plays an underappreciated role. Now, classical musicians determine these concepts according to the presence or absence of certain intervals, that is, the distance between notes, with some intervals sounding more pleasant and others sounding more discordant. And you know this if you've heard a major chord and you think, ah, oh, that's rather pleasing. Whereas if you just slammed your hand down on the piano and hit a random cluster of notes, the intervals of that are not so pleasing. They create dissonance. But besides intervals, some scholars believe there's also a property called sensory dissonance, uh, which is created by the roughness of overtones interfering with each other. And this roughness differs according to factors besides just intervallic content. So here is an example to consider. So if we were to analyze that purely harmonically, we'd say that this bit of Mozart is a lovely consonant stretch of major key music. But for some non-musicians, if you played this for them, they'd say that that sort of consonance would be outweighed by the harshness produced by those really low chords on the piano. Now, how harsh those low chords are will vary from instrument to instrument, as each keyboard instrument, even each piano, will have its own particular timbre. Uh, these examples all illustrate the role of timbre in the way you process the most basic musical structures, but they also hint at what I promised would be the next section of this talk, the contingencies of performance, which we'll look at shortly. But first, we'll take a little break for questions and answers. Hello. Wait. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Emily. So we did have a question that came in right before you started giving your last two examples. And it's from Michael okay. Hill and he asked for a few examples of pure timber. So would that, those two would, particularly the first one with the helium, would that be an example of that? Uh, so what do you mean by, uh, I'm not sure necessarily what he means by pure timber. Um, Sorry. There are people say, uh, people say things like sine tones um, have in some ways the, the purest timbre because they, they lack the differences that different instruments have according to the overtone series that they produce. Uh, so that might be, if he's talking about the concept of a timbre being pure, that might be one way of understanding it. Or I suppose the question could also mean, what is an instance of only timbre being varied? That is it being isolated while everything else remains the same. Uh, the helium example is pretty good. Um, so also are singing a note and just changing what vowel sound you make. So like holding a note and going, ah, ooh, yeah, all of that. That is changing pretty much just timbre. And that can also have pretty radical effects. I think even there has been some late 20th and early 21st century classical music that's played around with the way that um, vowel sounds produce timbre. So that would be another example of controlling it and varying only the timbre. Or you could take uh, multiple recordings of the same piece where you're hearing the same instrumentation and it's a different soloist and you, you can hear that difference. Adriana, do you want to 
Yeah, uh, thank you for that explanation. Um, I was really interested in your uh, first example about the car radio and how we were able to recognize um, the different genres of music instantly. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that relates to, I believe, uh, conceptualization is what you called it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, um, and like how how we put um, segmentation, segregation, and conceptualization together uh, in that example. Okay, great. I just want to add that David Lee just wrote in with a question very along those lines that how long does it take people to do this and how conscious are they in terms of identifying the style of music on a radio station, for example? So. Okay, a series of excellent questions. Uh, so I would say segmentation and uh, segregation happen over a decent period of time. Uh, I mean, certainly for segmentation, in order to cut it into chunks, you have to hear the things that you're going to cut into chunks. Um, uh, segregation can happen relatively quickly if you hear you're picking up multiple lines. As to conceptualization, yeah, genres are very much conceived as concepts, the concepts which are not naturally created, but are created through marketing and through culture. Uh, and certain genres of, of a singer and styles and mu of music, in fact, cultivate their personal identity very much through timbre. It's much easier to do that. There are only so many chord progressions in the world that you can write, especially within something that's more harmonically limited like contemporary popular music. But you can immediately brand your own voice as distinctive so that you can hear it like that. In terms of how long it takes, um, there have been studies that work on people recognizing a song from the first chord. And yeah, they can do it. They, they really can often do it, but it will rely precisely on, on, on timbre and spacing and something being somewhat unusual. It's not like they go, aha, C major, only one piece uh, begins with that. Thanks. Um, we have a couple more really good questions uh, coming in from the audience. Um, there's one from um, Marie Greeny who asks, uh, you gave examples of darkness, light, warmth, even sunbeams. What other kinds of vocabulary do musicians use to describe timbre? Oh, um, very, very good question. Um, so they, so softness and hardness would be another one I'd say. Uh, you can hear people talking about sounds being dry or rich. Um, when you talk about vocal timbres, people sometimes associate it with imagining what would happen to your voice in order to produce that. So you hear someone's voice being smoky literally because they associate it with what smoking does to your voice. You hear terms like gravelly. Um, but it's all, it's all quite interesting metaphors. And you notice almost all of these don't necessarily inherently have anything to do with sound. We're so much worse at describing sound precisely than we are at describing necessarily things that we, that we touch or we see. So part of conceptualization as we're talking about it is not only applying categories that are unique to music, but uh, categories that are cross-modal, that are borrowed from other senses and that make music a synesthetic, a multi-sensory experience, even for those who don't have literal synesthesia. That's really interesting. We have another, do you want another one? Sure, I mean, uh, well, let, let, let's, uh, let's take one more, then I'll do the second half. And if some of these still linger, I'm happy to address them after we do okay, the Okay, so we have a question from Jordan. Okay. Does musicology's relative lack of attention to sonority stem at all from the field's historical focus on certain genres of music in which sonority is less salient? Relatedly, are there genres of music in which sonority, consciously or unconsciously, is a more salient or significant feature? Okay, excellent question. Um, so part of what I'm saying with the practicality uh, is certainly linked to his question. That is, if you need to circulate that text that everybody can, uh, can read and talk about it the same way we analyze a poem, then you're naturally going to focus on the elements that are easiest to read off the page. And sonority is one of the hardest. You really need to be listening. Whereas harmony or rhythm, you know, we, we can just follow it along and you can read chords and you can read rhythms. Um, he, he's absolutely right, though, that music analysis focused on a certain period of 18th and 19th century music where, where I would argue in my work, sonority is very important. 
but you can get away with not talking about it. Um, sonority becomes increasingly important in the 20th century, especially when a lot of classical music is no longer tonal. Uh, the sense of closure, aha, this phrase has come to a close. You can no longer rely on chord progressions to naturally do that. And so um, a lot of elements of sonority need to do that work for you. Uh, so that would be an example. And as we were saying, with popular music, it, it really, really matters for guitarists, for vocalists, things like that. Uh, so thank you very much for all of those questions. I guess we'll go to the second half. And this doesn't mean that if you have questions at the end that relate to the first half, you, you can't ask them, you know, please uh, feel free. But we'll be addressing more of those then. All right, let me get my slideshow going again. All right, so that entire section was on the, the practicality and timbre, that combination. So now we're gonna talk about the, the philosophical background of what is essential music and the question of balance. So both the jangly forte piano that we heard and the balloon sucking baritone illustrate the effect that the fundamental timbre of a soloist can have. On a keyboard instrument with a mellower bass range, the Mozart passage would sound less dissonant to some. And variations between the timbres of different singers can be quite extreme, if generally not quite as extreme as the difference between oxygen breathing and helium breathing. But the contingency in the Foray Requiem case ran deeper than that. I already introduced one variable, which is the choice of addition that we use. That contingency determined whether or not there were horn parts to hear. But even if they're present, that doesn't ensure that they are audible. They're unusually prominent on Herr Vega's recording, which is why I played it for you. But on nine out of 10 other recordings, the horns are mostly or entirely inaudible. And if that element is inaudible to you, then you can't use it to carry out any of the functions that we just discussed. It might as well not exist. This is then the question of balance. And balance problems undermine the syntax sonority division that I established at the outset of this talk, because the aural presence of the syntactic elements is precisely what's at stake. That is, the syntax might change or might be there or it might not. So this is particularly true where concepts like melody and texture are concerned. So let's start with melody. Uh, think about this for a moment. If I asked you, how would you define what a melody is? So you might say it's the primary line. Okay, not bad, but what makes it primary? The answer, I think, is a matter of how you direct your attention. A melody is best understood as a stream, so remember stream from stream segregation, a stream that is subject to active attention. This is a perceptual definition, uh, and this perceptual framing can also be applied to texture, uh, which is a concept that overlaps quite a bit with scene that we reviewed earlier in this talk. Um, here, the metaphor that's often used is similar to painting. There is what's called figure ground hearing. Uh, we saw that actually in the first recording of the foray where I said, I heard the soprano and then I heard all of the accompaniment reading together. So it's, it's like looking at a painting and there's one figure that you're paying attention to and everything else is in the background. You know, some of you, for example, might not remember what's behind Mona Lisa. So that's figure ground uh, mode of attention. And that produces what is sometimes called hom homophony, homophonic listening. Um, but sometimes you perceive more than one of the streams that are going on as melodic, like a painting with multiple figures. And that I'm gonna say is polyphonic listening. And you can see the little cutesy diagrams uh, there. In the first one, there are those two streams, but the, the person is following only number one, as you can see from the arrow. And in the second one, they're following both. So balance affects all of these processes. So let's look at a few examples. Here is a passage from Chopin's Andante Spianato. The right hand is spinning out a series of sextuplets, groups of six notes. But few pianists treat these notes as equally weighted. Some of these notes make up a melody that's embedded within all of that passage work. But which ones? Those of you who are accustomed to reading music 
might see some hairpin marks above the right hand part. These might seem to propose streaming the middle two sixteenths of each text couplet as the figure and the rest, the other four, as the ground. So you can see that with the notes that I've marked in red on the screen. So if I played it evenly, that would be one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Whereas streaming those as the, the figure would be one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. And that's what I think Claudio Arau tries to realize in his, his recordings, which I'm about to play. And if you lowered your volume for the, the helium example, I've uh, turned it back up for this one. So that was the three, four, almost like, like the rhythm of a cuckoo call. Um, but other pianists propose alternative groupings in their performance. So next we're gonna to listen to Josef Hoffmann and he treats the first and fourth notes in each sextuplet as the melodic figure. So before three and four were stressed, we went one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now we're gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, and a third performance, Shura Tcherkovsky treats only the fourth note in each group of six as the melodic figure. So it's almost like you have this little stream running along and then you get these droplets of melody here and there. So we can call these cases of deciding which notes belong to a melody. Now, in all three of these cases, I would say figure ground hearing was preserved. That is, even if which notes belonged to the, the figure, the melody changed each time, there was only one melody to really follow. So now we're gonna consider a passage from the first movement of Schubert's final piano sonata. Most pianists, such as Wilhelm Kempf, who we're going to hear first, treat this as figure and ground as well, with the longer notes serving as the figure, the melody, and the running triplets serving as the background. So let's listen to that. So that was, that was, for most people, I would imagine, figure and ground. But now let's consider with, uh, what Vladimir Horowitz does with this passage. So he notices that within those running triple figures in the left hand, you can pluck out some notes. And if you pluck them out, they make the same melodic shape as part of the main melody. So I've, I've marked this as X with red notes. By playing those notes louder, bringing them out in the balance, he can therefore create the impression that this passage is imitatively polyphonic. That means there's a dialogue between two versions of the same melody. So let's hear that. Thus, uh, in this case, we can say the performer is determining how many lines are melodic and therefore whether a passage is homophonic or polyphonic. Now, not all polyphonic textures are made alike. In many, one voice is the lead melody and another is the counter melody. In the Schubert example we just saw, I think most people would say the lead was the upper line, but sometimes it's more ambiguous. So here is a passage from the Scherzo of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. 
we're going to do this one without a score uh, because it would be such a large page of music on the screen. But I've listed what I think are the three main elements. There's a scampering melody in the violins, a plaintive singing line in the low strings and bassoon, and then the high woodwinds have chords that land on off beats, almost like chuckles, like saying ha in the middle, ha ha ha. In many performances, it seems as if the violin line is the one that's leading. So we're going to start with Pierre Monteur and the London Symphony Orchestra, and I think this one, the violin leads. Okay, but on some recordings, or in some performances, I should say generally, there is little doubt that the lower line is intended to be lead melody, at least at the beginning before they trade roles. So here is Lauren Mazel with the Vienna Philharmonic. Okay, so we've now seen three ways that performers can use balance. To change which notes belong to the melody, change how many melodies there are, and change which melody is the main one. There's one more intervention I want to show, and this is what we might call the phenomenology of octaves. This is the most technical of them. Um, so for those of you not used to the term, doubling in octaves is what happens, for example, when females and males sing the same melody often. They're singing the same notes, but not in the same range. So you're starting on one F and the other person is starting on a different F and then you're following each other along and you're an octave apart, okay? But when this happens, what is the relationship between them? In other words, who is doubling whom? Um, so I'm going to play you an excerpt from the second movement of Schubert's great C major symphony. In this passage, uh, which you can see um, a transcription of here, the violins finish one line on the second staff there, which is succeeded by another one in which the clarinets and the violins play an octave apart. That's on the top line there. What performance can determine is which half of the octave, the upper or lower part, sounds like the origin point of the melody. So first I'm going to play you Nikolaus Harnenkort's recording with the Concerto Bau Orchestra. In this recording, I hear the upper part, the clarinet, as the predominant line. Okay, now I'm going to play you Ivan Fischer's recording with the Budapest Festival Orchestra. In it, the melody stays in the same octave the entire time. It's passed off from violin to violin almost in an unbroken line. I barely hear the clarinet as a clarinet. It seems as if it's just the first overtone of the violin part, or you could say almost the violin's shadow. From this, I would claim that there are four main ways to perceive octaves, and we just heard two of them. One is to say x is doubled above by y, as in Fisher's recording. Another is to say y is doubled by, below by x, as in Harnoncourt's. Two others would be to say that x and y move in octaves, so they're two, two equal partners moving an octave apart. Uh, and another would be to say there is only one moving entity, x, y, and it's an octave thick. So you can imagine like a right hand moving in a thick octave. Now, let's say I were to ask you which of those four descriptions most accurately describes experiencing this passage from the symphony. I hope that this question now strikes you as ill-formed, maybe even naive, because we've seen how much this varies with performance. Consider the issues we've just covered. Which voice is a melody, counter melody, or a mere background voice? 
most approaches treat all of these elements as stable properties of the work itself, as fixed elements of syntax. But the performances we've listened to falsify that notion. Interpretations that assume a stable piece cannot cut to the core of the piece because they're mediated by assumptions about what the piece will sound like, which a text cannot fully determine. Any discussion of musical meaning is an interpretation of an interpretation. That's an uncomfortable reality for people who want classical music to be about masterworks, rather than about the experience of masterworks as played by musicians or understood by listeners. But for the vast majority of people who come into contact with this sort of music, that's how meaning is in fact created. So to conclude this presentation, I'd like to briefly review what we discussed today and then consider what lessons we can take from this going forward. I explained the tendency of music scholarship and pedagogy to focus on musical syntax to the exclusion of sonority. I focused on two components of sonority, timbre and balance. I used them to counter two prejudices against sonority, the practical objection that it's difficult to nail down and analyze, and the philosophical objection that it's not an essential feature of musical pieces. So there are indeed ephemeral aspects of sonority. There is no way to, st uh, there is no standard way to measure timbre and balance. That is why I proposed shifting from discussing what sonority is to discussing what it does to us and what we can do with it. That's our first takeaway then. One way to start talking about sonority is to analyze its function, uh, which mental tasks it allows listeners to perform. Taking this approach leads us to our second takeaway. Many musical categories that we think of as belonging to the material domain of a piece of music are actually perceptual properties of how you, the listener, are listening. Third, if we want to understand perception, we need to study actual performances because it's performances that most of us react to when we listen and not some unmediated sheet music. We need to stop regarding scores as the only text and performances as something less than that. Performances are texts in and of themselves. And finally, analyzing sonority is not really viable. It is necessary. I haven't talked to you about why sonority should matter, but really about why it already matters to you, even if it doesn't necessarily to scholars. Uh, the concepts that are affected by it, segregation and segmentation, highness and lowness, consonance and dissonance, melody and accompaniment, homophony and polyphony, these are some of the most fundamental to music, period. I take it as a given that if we admit something is fundamental and we can build the tools to research, teach, talk about it, listen for it, then that's exactly what we should do. And I hope that what we did here tonight can be either the beginning or the continuation of your own journey in doing just that. Thank you very much for listening. I look forward to hearing the rest of your questions. Thank you, John, that was terrific. And we do have questions flowing in and I think we should talk about them a bit and then we'll talk about the assignment. Does that sound like a plan? And I'll, I'll talk a little bit so you can have a sip of water too. I think you earned it. Um, Don C asked a question. Uh, with all of your examples, with all your examples of different interpretations of the same music, are we simply seeing the limitation of musical notation? Would the composer have added more detailed descriptions if they could? Would composers do that? Or would they invite all these differences? Or would, would that depend upon the composer? I mean, do you, are there examples of other ways perhaps that composers have had tried to craft or impose um, certain musical interpretations on people who perform it? <clears throat> That's a great question. Yeah, so whether it's the limits of musical notation depends on whether you mean limits in a positive or negative way. Some people would say exactly as your characterization is, I think, that this is a limit in the sense of being a shortcoming, that the goal, if we could, as, a, as composers, would be to control uh, the musicians as much as possible. And there are certainly composers who people would say over notate. So if we're talking just about the classical world, and we almost have to be because this level of detail in performance instruction is not necessarily common outside of it. Composers like Ravel or Mahler or Tchaikovsky to a certain extent are peppering it with tons of markings uh, and telling they want you to follow every little thing about what they want to do. Uh, of course, when 
some people of that generation, in spite of their detailed markings, actually Mahler is a perfect example. When he interpreted other people's work, he did whatever the heck he wanted. So there's, um, there's some people who are control freaks when they're composers and do not, uh, do not stomach being controlled when uh, they are performers. But honestly, this, is, this really varies from tradition to tradition and time period to time period. As a performer, what are your rights to interfere with or disobey what a composer has told you to do? Um, Anna, do you wanna pose one? Yeah, we got a couple of questions from the audience that were along the same lines. So we're gonna be combining those, but um, basically people were asking whether our environments and therefore our familiarity with certain styles of music um, makes it easier for us to perceive their uh, all of these qualities, their syntax, the mel melodies that are there, uh, makes it easier for us to listen in different ways, polyphonically and homophonically. Um, yeah. Absolutely. That's a great question. So in this talk, you know, I, I have to rely on my own experiences or I make some generalizations about I, what I think yours might be in response to this. But some of my own research is about the difference between possible ways of hearing. So all of these contingencies and differences exist not only in the gap between the music and the performance, but between the performance and you. Um, your ability to segment this or pick apart different lines may deal with your familiarity with this. The ability of a particular sound to communicate genre to you really depends on how your concept of genre works. If you're not someone interested in pop music, all contemporary pop might sound the same to you. And if you're someone really into it, you might be quite offended that the, that the idea that timbre X is remotely like timbre Y. They, they designate completely different styles, completely different spheres of culture. So your personal experience matters a huge amount. And that's, if anything, what makes a perceptual angle even more important. Because when you're doing it, you have to be attentive to individual difference whereas the score or a piece is one unified thing and you can get away with, with assuming that there is one unified experience that arises out of it. Thanks. I have a question here from Vinay. Okay. You, you gave an example of how a simultaneously played new instrument, timbre, affects the overall mood on a piece of music, of a piece of music. Mm -hmm. Are there examples of similar differential effects due to different preceding pieces of music or presumably parts of a piece. Um, in other words, can certain timbres presented in one part affect the perception of a subsequent part? Would that imply that timbre and balance can affect the overall dynamic state of the limbic system? <coughs> oh my. Well, thank you for that question. I'm not going to uh, stray into limbic territory, although you, you are welcome, of course, to look up more about the, the biology of this. But absolutely. So what I was saying about how individual experience, including cultural experience, shapes these things also applies to prior experience within the same piece of music. Oh, I heard this instrument or this theme associated with such and such emotion or such and such character then. Now it's coming back that feels like a development or alteration to something I already know. And when we're talking about styles more generally, Things like pastiche or parody or homage or in certain forms of contemporary popular music, sampling re relies on you knowing something about the source or previous or standard use of something. So there are, there are ways, as they say, that are intra opus is the term in classical music, where you learn from your experience within a piece, prior things that happen in the piece shape you, uh, shape how you hear, and then there's inter opus, as they say, between works, the connections you draw. Like in movies, when they have the riff and the theme, and then it shows up in a different sort of tone. Exactly, exactly. Um, we have a few more questions. Um, there's one from Andrea Lighthall, um, who asks, uh, who is wondering if you could talk about why dissonance in classical music can be so satisfying and how performers choose to emphasize or de-emphasize dissonances. Okay, thank you very much for that question. Um, so there have been different theories about the role of dissonance in classical music, certainly before music became atonal. Uh, in other words, before, uh, dissonance, before music was written in no key whatsoever and dissonance became something of a norm. In a lot of music before that, 
in, at least within uh, Western classical music, there are debates as to how universal this trope is. A lot of it works in terms of tension and release. Um, you, make, uh, you make someone desire the resolution of a particular dissonant note or chord, like, ooh, this creates angst, and ah, finally, what I wanted to happen is satisfied. I mean, it's very similar to asking, what's the point of drama and strife and tension and bad events in a movie or play or story? It's actually very similar, except the difference being in music, whereas in a drama or story in general, there's one main action or plot that runs throughout. Music is a series of micro little, little dissonances and dramatic events whose tension uh, is released. Uh, for the purpose of uh, getting to the Don Giovanni example, maybe we take only two more? Does that seem fair? I'll, I have one. Okay. Phenomenologically, this is from mm -hmm. Michael Hill. Okay. If we bracket all of the concepts you have introduced, is there anything left? <laughs> if this we bracket, a big one. yeah. Um, in, in a sense, is there music beyond all of these? Yeah. Conceptual uh, designations, or do you, if you start using those designations, then is is that does that does that fully explain music? Oh, uh, so first of all, no, uh, it doesn't fully explain music. That is, if anything. What I did today is almost deliberately a supplement to what I think most music discussions would do. That is, all of the other elements I talked about, harmony, rhythm, form, are really, really important. So if you bracketed out what I talked about, yeah, there's a lot left over. It would be exactly what you're likely to encounter in a music classroom. There are certain questions, though, there are, and if we're talking phenomenology, I won't get too deep in this. Can you listen to music without conceptualizing? That's a huge debate. That is whether you can ever just purely listen to sound or whether you're always doing those tasks to some degree, whether or not you're using timbre to do them. And that's a discussion too involved for me to get into it now, but that's something perhaps you might, might reflect on. Um, and I guess our, our last question for now, okay. um, that is very related to what you were just talking about. Uh, Teddy Knox asks, where lies the core of academic disagreement on sonority? Do scholars disagree on how it's defined or what constitutes it? Or just how important is it to study? Okay, thank you very much, Teddy. Uh, so the way I'm defining sonority is a little idiosyncratic. I needed a catch-all term for a lot of the different things that I'm talking about. Most people would disagree with what sonority means. And that, to me, doesn't matter that much. Uh, the, the sorts of the disagreements are actually more or less the ones I said at the beginning. That is the philosophical conviction that eh, if this varies from performance to performance, it can't cut to the core. Or the feeling of like, eh, this is kind of hard to talk about and I just want to deal with the text. That's radically changed in the last few years, partly because the technology has gotten better. So you can do some computer analysis. It works really well for voice and really poorly for orchestral music because you can't pull apart different lines easily, you can't isolate them. But also, the sudden surge in people analyzing pop music has made this much more of a hot topic than it was, although that hasn't necessarily carried over to classical music. Because if you're not talking about the timbre of individual voices, you really don't understand how a lot of pop music works. And you might, and for a while we've gotten away with thinking that we can understand how classical music works without it, but you can only get so far. That's my opinion anyway, and I hope I illustrated some of that. Um, with you can't that, go wrong with turning to Don Giovanni, you know. Yes, so we're <laughs> going to do that. I suppose, I mean, if we have time then we can come back to questions. Absolutely. But I, I suspect we might not. So for those of you, there was an optional assignment for you to look at uh, the duet La Ci Dorem La Mano from Don Giovanni. If you didn't listen to it in advance, it doesn't matter. We're, we're going to play um, individual clips from it and talk about it. But this is uh, a duet from an opera, Don Giovanni, and the particular scene going on here is that Don Giovanni, the seducer of all seducers, has happened across a uh, peasant couple. Uh, the, the bride's name is Zerlina, and he invites them to hold their upcoming wedding at his residence. He will uh, beneficently host them. Uh, and he has ulterior motives, which is to seduce Zerlina, the bride. And this is his duet saying, you know, come take my hand, I will lead you to my residence. Um, his intentions being clear to the audience, 
and maybe clear or not clear to Zerlina. So the question I ask, this being an opera, we're likely to focus on the voices, and that's absolutely right in some ways. But Mozart has taken quite a lot of care in deciding what to do to the instrumental parts. Uh, so actually, do you have in front of you the way I phrased the question? I don't recall it exactly. If not, I can more or less paraphrase. Um, um, I can, yeah, are you there? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm, I can hear you. Okay, consider the question, how do the colors of the different instrumental background lines reinforce, contradict, or alter the meaning of the words being sun, sung? Okay, and so that, that is your assignment of sorts at the moment. Um, Post it on there the, is a text um, is that is also available on the website. Maybe we should post the website so people can pull up the text as well. Yes, so in the chat, um, and uh, there will hopefully be a link to the website. I have the text in, in Italian, Italian and English simultaneously, the Italian they're singing, and an English translation. There's also a YouTube link to the particular performance I was using. I certainly hope for your experience you've been able to hear the music very clearly uh, while, uh, while streaming. But if you haven't, you can, instead of my playing it, um, uh, listen to it again on YouTube. So I'm going to play the very beginning of this uh, duet. And again, listen for what the instruments are doing and, and deliver unto us whatever insights you may have. Uh, I'm going to play this. You'll let me know, Emily, if you're hearing sound or not. Okay, let's start with just that much because I think there's already quite a bit there that you might have picked up on. Uh, so please feel free to uh, let us know in the same place where you're typing the Q&A perhaps, uh, what things you picked up on. It could be observation of just details you heard that you don't know how to interpret or there might be details where you specifically go, aha, this makes me hear X. And hopefully my moderators will, will pass on to me some of the observations that you've made. I think people were so enthralled by the beauty of the passage that they have not put into okay. words. I, I, could, I, could, I could play the beginning of that one more time and, and see what you so wait, 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 could you say again the question you want us to say, say, pose the question? Okay, yeah. What are the instruments, the different instrumental colors doing? You know, in other words, how does this differ from when you hear the opera and there's just a pianist accompanying? What is he doing with the instruments? And how does this support, contradict, how does this interact with the meaning of the text? Can you get anything from it that you couldn't get from just the vocal lines alone? So I'll play those two segments again. Let, let's stop there and see what observations we, we may have. We have a few coming in. Uh, okay. First is from Stephanie Green, who uh, notes that there is a uh, contradiction in the first stanza. The instruments are tentative while uh, Don Giovanni's invitation is firm. Um, and in the second stanza, which I also noticed that there is a violin tremor with um, Zerlina's uh, mi trema, which is um, my tremble. 
Okay, nice. Heart, heart troubles, yeah. And so the question you might have if you, uh, if you as a listener hear the tentativeness, and some of you might not, is what's creating that? And I assume some of that perhaps is the, the gentleness and the umpa umpa of the strings. At least um, the background there is not as perhaps ardent as we know his intentions are. So that contradiction maybe you could interpret as the, the facade he's putting on, gently, gently. Uh, other comments? Um, David writes, the strings are vamping lightly, suggesting anticipation while the singers sing. During the periods between, there are these little sighs down in the strings. Mm hmm okay. So he's hearing sighs in the strings. Uh, so yes, vamping at the beginning. I guess I would, I would ask, is there any difference in what's going on instrumentally in the in-between spots where he's hearing the sighs? Is there anything going on there as well? Uh, other comments? We have a really lovely one from Janet. Who okay. says, the orchestra portrays a formal setting, a nice three-quarter waltz which, with strings on beats two and three, which is all very proper, but the song is about a young woman getting seduced. Okay, yes. And so you're hearing a, 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 a disconnect there between the, uh, the, the mood and what's going on. The one, the one correction I'll make is it's not actually in three. Yeah, it is in two. So umpa, umpa uh, going on. And that is potentially useful because this is not quite dancing music yet. It is walking pace and he is talking about guiding her. Any other comments? Yeah, Michael writes, the flute doubles the young woman and there's symbolic value to that because flutes suggest innocence. Good, uh, and that will be important later in this duet. So um, one of the points I'll make is there is a strict division between how he's using strings and how he's using winds. Uh, all of the umpa umpa background that you heard is strings, but all of the little bits of connecting material, suddenly the winds enter in there. Um, and there's the da 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 connecting each of, uh, each of those that the winds are doing. So that, that division of labor affords you, anytime that happens, an opportunity to interpret the winds as somehow different from the strings, um, as performing a separate function. And that's a great point to be making there. That, that wind drawing in doesn't have a flute yet until she comes, um, and that's adding her into that. You also might ask the question of, what are the winds symbolizing in general that the strings aren't? I may have more to say about that. But are there any other comments? Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, Beata, uh oh, writes when Don Giovanni starts singing, it's very melodic, whereas she is more crisp. Someone else, Susan, remarks that the female sounds as if she is dancing. So, mm -hmm. right even here, we're getting different senses of interpretation of the interpretation. Exactly. Yeah. And all of those things you're hearing there are very much dependent on the vocal delivery and to a certain extent, the vocal timbre. I mean, some of it is rhythmic, some of it is other things, but certainly the idea of tentativeness or boldness is, 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 is being uh, communicated a little bit by uh, tr things we associate with sounding like, like confidence or like trembling or like being timorous. Things like that are certainly part of it. I'll, I'll point out one other thing. That oh. Yes, go ahead. I mean, I would, I would almost say, and I wonder what you would think about this, but it, it to me, the sort of underlying, um, the violins playing it, 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 and the, the, the parallel between Don Giovanni's verse and Zerlina, I mean, it's as if the music, it felt to me as if the music is also really trying to seduce her. So it's not just about the words, it's about <laughs> this repeated motif that comes in both places. Good, I agree very much. And I'm gonna replay it from the beginning, except we're gonna keep going forward. But I'm gonna to tie together a lot of these different ideas we have. So a lot of people have mentioned that the strings are vamping, that is playing a repeated accompaniment pattern, so the umpa umpa. And as, as we've already discussed, that's a little bit walking-like. But there's also a sense that the strings are, are remaining more neutral than the winds in this. That is, they're the normal instruments that have less um, explicit commentary to deliver. But what the winds are doing, what David called the sighing, is interesting because uh, for those of you who know how a key works, there's a home note, which is do, as in do, re, mi, do, which is the first note in the scale. 
Normally getting to there is like, aha, finality. And every single time in the beginning, the winds are bringing you back to there, are sort of pulling and conducting you along. Ba, mi, re, do. And again, they're coaxing you towards that. So there's the, there's the light sort of walking rhythm of the strings, but the actual coaxing is, is happening from the winds. Uh, so things I'll, I'll emphasize as we, I'll start over so you can hear some of that. But as this proceeds, is there more of a difference between what the winds of strings are doing? I'd keep in mind the flute representing Zerlina, which is an observation that one person very wisely um, made. short there, but there's a lot to talk about in already the two additional sections that I've given you. So we'll see if there are any little observations that have cropped up. So we had that, that noon section after they both sang, and then we had that section where they're both in closer dialogue to the same music as originally uh, that we heard. So let's see if there are any observations in the chat uh, about how the instruments are being used, especially anything about the winds versus the strings. noticed that um, there's a horn, I guess, that has been introduced in this section, uh, which makes it uh, related to hunting. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, the horn has been added. It is sometimes connected to hunting and by extension to the nobility. So if you wanted to do that sort of broader cultural connection, you, you could wonder whether it's uh, there's an edge of Don Giovanni being a noble in here. And indeed, this relationship uh, is mediated by the noble trying to take advantage of the peasant. It's very much a part of uh, uh, the Don Giovanni social commentary. Anything else? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Renee writes the soldo resolution in the flutes is quite strong after Z, Z, Z sings. It's nicely contrasted with the sighing in what Don Giovanni, in between Don Giovanni's phrases. So maybe she is on board with what is happening, at least at this point. Then the flute duets with Don Giovanni and the piece resolves more fully. Okay, so some great points there. So first of all, as, as she's correctly noting, uh, the flute immediately when it entered was part of what I was saying, that coaxing. So already it's on board with being coaxed. On board is a, is a very good term there. Then you're noticing another thing. When they're coming back at the end, he is paired with a flute. He's singing the melody together with the flute playing a melody. And she, and I'll replay it at the end, is singing her melody in connection with another instrument, this time a bassoon. Uh, someone noted before flute, typical feminine instrument because of its highness and the woodwinds. Bassoon is a very typical male instrument because it's the lowest woodwind. Mm -hmm. So um, her reading of that is, oh, maybe she's already on board. That's, I think, 
an, an excellent reading. You can think of this as saying, oh, we're talking in the imperative, we're talking about the future. You know, come along, maybe you'll submit, maybe you won't. But the music says otherwise. No, 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 I, Don Giovanni, am already linked to singing with the symbol of you, the flute, and Eisner Lina am already sort of joining hands with the bassoon, the symbol of you. It, it's a fait accompli. The winds have already told you that. So that's, um, Marie makes that point. When yeah. the melody comes up after the first section we talked about, Don Giovanni starts getting doubled by the flute, while Zerlina starts getting doubled by the bassoon, reinforcing the idea that he is reassuring her and she is being persuaded. Very good. I shouldn't have even spoken. I shouldn't have anticipated that someone else had, had, had arrived at that exact interpretation. Very good. Stephanie, yeah, Stephanie did as well. She um, mentions that as Don Giovanni's lines continue, the flute is within the accompaniment as a uh, Zerlina has already joined him. Very nice. Smart crowd. Uh, uh, I, I agree very much with that. Um, great. Are there any other observations? Well, Michael notes that he's hunting her and again, enter the horn. Nice. And the other thing when I replay it is notice what the horns are doing melodically as compared to everyone else. And some of this is just the limitation of the horn at the, at the time. All of the others of uh, the winds either doubled, as we saw at the end, that is playing their melody at the same time, or it coaxed with these lines that sort of descended, as I said, towards the home note. The horns play the same note repeatedly, urge forward, forward, forward. They're just pushing her along. Uh, so that's a thing perhaps to notice as well. It's not merely the instrumental colors themselves, but how that combines with what the actual material they're playing is like. Other observations? Um, yes, we have uh, a great observation from Andrew, who um, is relating this segment of your talk to the previous segment. Um, uh, they cite a passage from the Metropolitan Opera Synopsis uh, of Don Giovanni, uh, in which the final sentence of this passage is, the tone of Don Giovanni is wholly dependent on the production and the singer's interpretations of their parts. Um, which uh, they say supports tonight's discussion as it notes the pivotal role that the timbre of the singers plays in, in, the, in the interpretation of the score. Yes, very good, very much so. Um, how, how suave is Don Giovanni? How overtly threatening? How not threatening at all? How, I mean, we, we, this fits with it. whoever said the first observation about feeling her, her delivery is maybe more trembling than his. All of that is, is, is performer's license. Uh, we are running fairly short on time. So to conclude this, I think I'm going to play it again. Uh, please um, listen for all of the things that the various people have mentioned. One other thing I'll note. So I'm gonna play this again from what you might call the, the B section. In other words, we heard at the very beginning, he sang his entreaty, she repeated it back. Then we got that new music in between. I'm going to start it uh, from that new music in between. As a matter of fact, do I have the translation with me? I may not, uh, but I was about to give you the exact words that he's singing at that moment. But you'll, you'll, you'll have it on your um, screen in front of you. It's exactly where Don Giovanni re-enters after she sang. That's where I'm going to start. Um, and so notice again, his entreaties have, his entreaties have the winds pushing her her responses back, which really is her sort of withdrawing a little, are, are mostly strings, except for as someone pointed out, that horn pushing forward. Then at the end, while she wavers back and forth, the winds are with her, and then she's gonna be drawn into exactly that flute bassoon dialogue that so many of the people caught. All right, so I'm going to start it from there and that will be our close. And 
and I'm sorry to cut it short, but uh, you have much liberty and, and free time, of course, to listen to it all the way through, which I highly recommend. So I have a, a, a final big question for you. You started yeah. off by saying you don't want people to be receivers of music. Mm -hmm. uh, to, yes, to be sort of pure, perfect, passive receivers, yeah. Okay, so if, if you've given us a taste of what's studying with you, if we were able to have you teach a class at Graham, for example, next summer, I know you can't during the academic year. What, I mean, what, would, what do you want people to walk away from this lecture and from your classes really equipped to do? Okay, so a couple of things. Some of it is to more attentively listen to particular instruments and think what, what they're doing. Some of it is to tap back into your own experience. When I'm teaching in general, I say that there are sort of two goals simultaneously. There are some experiences where you don't want your mind changed, where you're not there to, to become a new person. You're there to understand the way you hear already better. Like, what are the processes that's going into this? What does my mind do? What makes the way I hear the way I hear? So that's part of it. And then the other part is to be open to new hearings. So I hope simultaneously you understand your brain a little better in what it's doing while you listen. And you're also thinking, oh, here are some things I could listen for. But in terms of what we talked about with performance, um, a lot of people think classical music is a dying art. And unfortunately, in an economic sense, it is. Um, but what makes it important to keep it as a living art is not necessarily how great the music, uh, the masterworks are, masterworks in quotation or no quotation, depending on how you feel about them, although that's very important. What keeps it living is the fact that performances will constantly change the meaning of it. And I've hopefully given you some tools to think about that in ways that were more subtle than let's say where the production is set or you know, very extreme changes. There are all of these quite subtle things that are really changing your, ex uh, that your experience. And hopefully you'll be able to explore more recordings and performances to hear those differences. And hopefully that keeps you interested in seeing different people continually perform some of the same music throughout the rest of your lives. Well, John, we are drawing to a close. Gus, I'm wondering if we could pull up that, those final closing slides of ours. Adriana, um, well, first of all, John, I really want to say thank you. This was a wonderful, enlightening, and beautifully put together lecture. Um, and so I, much all I want to do now is go home and listen to Don Giovanni from the start. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's the sign of a good lecture. Um, Adriana, do you have any final question or remark for Adriana, uh, for John, that you want to ask him? John, you don't have to go away. Oh, I don't? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, uh, other than to say thank you so much. I feel like I learned so much about uh, how to listen to music just from this short amount of time listening to you. And it's it's really fascinating. I'm, I'm very um, happy that you've uh, you accepted our invitation to uh, Arts of Graham. Yes, and one yeah, last, are you a musician, John? Are you a musician yourself? What do you play, if so? Uh, I play the piano incredibly incompetently. Um, uh, I, <laughs> so I, I studied to be a, a composer trying to control how other people played. Uh, but my own playing is, 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 is not worth hearing. But control or advise how other people? <laughs> No, I gave a lot of room for interpreting. But honestly, the fact that I don't play that much and I, I was so much a consumer rather than a player made me really aware of how different performances varied. I think people who, I'm, I'm not denigrating playing at all, but people who play a lot sometimes are caught in their own interpretation. Mm -hmm. And I was always hearing the interpretations of others. Um, especially since I, uh, I study orchestral music and I, I play the piano, which is not an orchestral instrument. So that probably had an effect too. Well, with this, we are closing in on the end. And I do want to thank you, John. Thank Adriana, Jan, and Gus, all this behind the scenes work. I also want to remind you to please consider joining us at the sample discussion of the basic program. Even if you're, you know, you won't regret turning up for this event at all. I think we have another slide. Those are some related courses at Graham that might interest you. And next one. And then finally, for those of you who have been with us tonight or for also other, um, other 
previous lectures, if you found it, I know that it's a very trying time in this country economically and not part of the reason we are doing these free and we're doing them now is to connect with people who may not be able to come and may not be able to do pay for activities. Um, but if you are able to give to help us support and continuing to do these kinds of activity, we would certainly be grateful. We are dedicated to the liberal arts and as everyone knows and people in the arts know, it's not a hugely revenue generating enterprise. Um, and we really feel strongly about the importance of connecting with the public. So thank you for your attendance and we all wish you a fine and productive and safe and healthy evening. Thank you for joining us at Grant.